Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our snow melting solutions webinar. I'm your host, Greg Jackman, the specification program specialist here at Watts. Today's webinar is our next installment in the Watts Works Engineer Webinar Series, geared specifically for you guys, our engineers, architects, and specifier customers. As you can see, I am dressed up in my winter gear, even though it is the, it is the you know middle of August right now, but in celebration of today's topic. I thought this would be appropriate. So uh, before we kick, th kick things off today, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background on this webinar series. So Colin, if you click it to the next slide. Uh, so we hold uh, several webinars throughout the year that cover a variety of topics. Uh, our presenters are always our in-house technology experts, product experts, and thanks to our partnership with the American Society of uh, Plumbing Engineers, ASPE, we're able to provide you with uh, point one continuing education unit credit if you stick around for the entire webinar. Uh, after today's, uh, our next webinar will be on October 8th, where we'll be talking about uh, optimizing building safety with digital mixing. So if you're interested in uh, registering for that webinar, just keep your eye out for our emails, and, or you can reach out to me directly at gregory.jackman at wattswater.com, and I'll sign you up. So with that said, I'd like to int introduce you to uh, the presenter of today's webinar, Colin Marshall our systems engineering manager at Watts. Uh, Colin's been active in the hydronic radium market since 1995. During this time, he's authored the technical manual understanding radiant systems for RESES. And Colin, can you click to the next slide? Yeah. Maybe. So during the duration of the presentation today, uh, the phone lines will be muted, but we encourage you to submit questions via the chat window. You can just hover over the chat icon at the bottom of the WebEx you type in your question there, uh, then we'll address them uh, as the presentation goes on and then after uh, Colin is finished as well. So with that, let me pass it off to Colin to get started. Excellent, thanks, Greg. Uh, appreciate that. A couple things here before we get started. You know, this, as Greg mentioned, is an ASPE uh, approved course. Um, and uh, this course may or may not be accepted for PE renewal. So that's something that you have to kind of dive into and. and research as well. Um, so you have some some outlines and profiles there that you can kind of read through. Oops, wrong way. A um, couple things that we're going to look at today for, from the objective standpoint is why are we looking at snowmelt systems? What are some of the reasons that we want to dive into and maybe design or offer snowmelt as a solution? What are the key factors to look at? Um, is every application snowmelt friendly? Are there some that we should or should not uh, consider what are the the options to consider in designing a snowmelt system uh, there are definitely some pros and cons and there are some impacts financially um, depending upon what your needs are and what you're trying to achieve those can be factors to consider as well we'll look at some of those um, controls big aspect to a, a snowmelt system there are a lot of different ways to control a snowmelt system the driving factor there is going to be how much information do you want to glean out of the system? How much uh, control do you want to have over it manually versus automatic? Um, other considerations are going to be looking at tubing choices, type of systems to use, hydronic versus electric, um, some other considerations along those lines, and some of the accessories that go into making a snowmelt system work. So we'll hopefully get through those. Uh, again, uh, to kind of reiter reiterate what uh, Greg had said, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, best thing is to type it into the chat win window and we'll catch it as we go along. I don't necessarily read those as well as I should when speaking, so Greg is gonna catch those for me and interject as as they come up. Um, or you can save your questions till the end and we'll kind of answer them all at once, whichever is most convenient for you. So first thing right off the bat is a poll. And throughout the presentation, we're gonna have three or four of these poll questions, just to kind of get a feedback as to where the audience is. Where do you guys uh, sit relative to your experience and knowledge of snowmelt systems? And what exactly it is you're looking for uh, when you start to consider a snowmelt system? So this is the first of those four or five questions. Um, how many snowmelt projects have you been involved in? So we'll let this kind of sit there and churn for a few seconds and then kind of review the, the results. Yeah, a lot of people answering. Ah, nice, nice. And that's one of the things with uh, 
online presentations, you don't always get that good feedback sometimes. I, I like giving presentations in person because you get that energy of, of people asking questions and throwing things out there. So this is a good way to kind of help supplement that. So all the presentation or participation is, is helpful. The poll is now closed and I will show the results. Nice. So it looks like most people have some some experience, at least one to five seems to be the winner there. All right, so maybe we'll we'll hit some topics here that you haven't considered before. Uh, commercially applicable. So what exactly are we looking for? Where is a snowmelt system really going to shine? And there are a lot of applications that allow a snowmelt system to be a good choice from a design standpoint. Um, hospitals, airports, entry ramps, uh, handicap access entries, things where it's critical that we keep a free and clear snow, uh, uh, snow free and clear of, of the area. Um, there may be some other ex examples, industrial complexes. So you have parking lots, uh, Maybe it's a loading dock for where semis back up to, and you want to make sure that the semis have good traction. Um, the helipads are a good one because you can have helipads either on the ground or up in the air on top of a building, say a hospital, for example. And in that area, uh, you're, you're looking at a lot of different things for, from a snowmelt perspective. Obviously, it's the personnel who are moving to and from the heli uh, helicopter into the building. But it's also looking at maybe, you know, secondary debris as the downwash from the helicopter uh, approaches the surface, the landing surface, it can kick up snow and debris up over an edge. And so that can be a hazard to secondary people walking by or people down on the ground below. So sometimes snow melt systems are taking into account more things than just simply convenience of removing snow. We're looking at a broader area sometimes and car washes. Another good example of snow melt. Here you're dealing with, with an environment that is not necessarily contingent upon actual snowfall, but it's more contingent upon freeze conditions. So you can have a snow melt or a car wash, wash system that is sunny outside, but it's 20 degrees. And as cars come out of the car wash and sit and pause on the exit apron, maybe waiting to get into the roadway or into traffic, they're dripping water onto a cold surface that can freeze. And so now you're trying to maintain a safe environment so the next car that comes out doesn't hit a patch of ice and slide into traffic. Um, but that may or may not be contingent upon the actual... Colin, it seems like your audio cut out. It's like uh, we lost Colin's audio. Uh, just need a minute to check on that. Only way to have that area free and clear of, of snow and ice for when people arrive is to, to get up in the middle of the night and start uh, clearing the snow. Um, that requires somebody to get out. It requires somebody to actually do that. It's time. It's it's all those things. Um, whereas a snowmelt system may allow that to be always free and clear of snow without the, the added time and hassle of somebody actually managing that. Um, chemical damage is also a concern when, when looking at snowmelt systems. Um, there's a lot of damage to the actual snowmelt area, that material, whether it's concrete, sand and brick paver, even asphalt. Uh, when you start throwing down salt or other snow melt chemicals, those things can and potentially directly impact the, the surface quality of those things. Uh, you take a sanded brick paver area and that chemical can start to etch the stone over time. Um, you can have a secondary effect from that is like say hotels where you throw out a bunch of snow uh, salt on the snow melt area out front and as people walk into the lobby, they're bringing all that chemical in with them, all the salt, all the harshness of what's been thrown outside, and they're dragging it across the tile 
interior or the carpeted interior, and now you have an environment that is being abused inside. Um, and you don't want that. It, it degrades the beauty of the interior. It damages the stone or tile inside, and you don't want any of that. Um, so you want to try and maybe keep that free and clear as well. Um, liability is one of those things that has become more and more of an awareness point for snowmelt systems, just like uh, fire suppression systems on commercial buildings in some residential areas, if you install a fire suppression system, typically you are able to leverage that safety element against insurance costs or against building liability costs because you've done something to reduce the hazard presented by a potential fire. So you install a fire protection system to mitigate that. Snow melting systems are kind of the exact same thing, but dealing with the hazards of ice. You know, you have somebody who walks across a driveway or walks across a sidewalk and hits a patch of black ice and falls. Now you are liable for that injury. Uh, if we do something to mitigate that and take that risk out of the equation, then that is something that maybe you can take to the insurance company and go, look, I have the system. What can I do from my policy standpoint? And that can be something that, that can happen from uh, project to project or area to area. So it's worth investigating. And, and really, snow melt uh, or snow removal injuries happen a lot, whether it's the slip and falls or just simply the, the rigors and the strain of physically having to remove the snow. Um, that's one of the leading causes of heart attacks in the wintertime is people shoveling snow. So if we can eliminate that risk, um, it's it's all for the good. Uh, convenience and accessibility. Uh, again, we kind of hit on some of these aspects before, but if you can keep the area open uh, from a retail standpoint, allow people access into your building easier, that's just going to help maintain uh, customer flow into your building. Um, sometimes it's a convenience issue. Outdoor patios uh, are, are definitely cleaner. You can use a space more of a year-round environment as opposed to just uh, having to maintain it manually with when it snows. Um, and we kind of already talked about the, the labor requirement to maintain that free area if it were to snow at night. Um, we kind of talked on this also, uh, maintaining the quality of the stone uh, in this environment where if you were to to abuse this area year after year with salt and other chemicals, it will start to etch away and maybe ute colors of the stone over time, but it's also going to just, you know, tear it up. So eventually you're going to have to replace that stone um, over time. So we want to extend the longevity of our surface as much as possible. Okay, poll number two. What industries are requesting snowmelt solutions? Are you seeing these on industrial, commercial? Residential? Um, are you seeing them at retail? What kind of applications or, or industries are using or requesting snow melts? Healthcare? Give the poll another 10 seconds or so. All right. And each of these probably have a different reason for looking at snowmelt systems. You know, residential could be simply convenience. Uh, retail is definitely, you want to allow customers access. Uh, healthcare could be safety um, for for uh, the workers, the medical workers, as well as for the customer or the patients. Hospitality is the uh, same thing. Um, okay, poll is closed. And here are the results. Healthcare seems to be the winner on this one. Nice. Yeah, hospitals are definitely the one that we see a lot of. Um, whether it's the emergency entrance area uh, where the ambulance comes into play, the helipad, uh, as I mentioned before, sidewalks just to get in from the parking lot. Um, all those areas are, are definitely um, important for healthcare because people who are going to the hospital or going to the clinic, they're already in some sort of distress. They, they've been injured. They have a broken limb. They're, they're not feeling well. They're not really focused on 
trying to maintain their balance and footing, they're worried about other things that are taking place. And so they're more likely to be uh, exposed to a, an accidental slip and fall due to ice because they're just not focused on the environment that they're in. Yeah, okay, we, just to add on to that, we have a couple of comments come in. Yep. Um, we find it more in commercial transportation, train stations, airports, things like that. Yeah, uh, train stations. We've actually seen an uptick in train stations uh, here lately, and and again, that's that's all because of awareness and and liability issues. But we're doing the 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 uh, platforms for when you get in or on and off the train, especially those that are outside, obviously. Um, but we've seen an uptick in those um, airports. We do a lot of airports. Uh, the big thing about airports is we're not doing the whole the whole runway. That's just financially uh, prohibitive, typically. Um, Plus, there's a lot of structural issues where the plane comes in. But what we do on airports are what we call hot pads. So we will melt an area that uh, is a pit, and they'll blade the snow off into these pits, and then we'll melt them at an accelerated rate. Most airports have to remove the snow by um, taking the snow off of the site. And once you leave the airport grounds, then they usually have to pay for um, – some sort of purification process for the snow. They can't just go dump it anywhere. So it becomes a almost like a hazmat condition where they have to, to regulate where that snow goes. If they're able to just process it there on site, they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about the cost of transporting the snow or any of the other things. So big, big thing for airports, those hot pads. Um, financial. Uh, again, you know, revenue issues that we consider if it's a retail site, um, lawsuits we talked about if somebody slips and falls and, and liability issues. Uh, each year, about half a billion dollars is spent defending accidental claims due to snow injuries. Um, it's just as a big deal. Um, somebody gets hurt on your property, you're, you're responsible regardless of what caused that. Um, and then, of course, you actually have the cost to remove the snow manually, um, like with the airports. If you have to pay to have all the snow trucked off, and that's a you know cost of gas, cost of labor, cost of time, um, the purification of the snow, all that stuff in, to do that is it's costly, um, and then just having people on call paying overtime and so forth can be a big deal. Okay, from a design standpoint. There are a lot of considerations to figure out what is the optimal design for a snowmelt system? What is it that we're trying to do? And part of understanding our option is understanding our options. Part of looking at the design is knowing what's available from the design standpoint. So we have an electric solution and we have a hydronic solution. Now a hydronic solution is where we put tubing in the concrete or the, or the snow melt area and we run some sort of fluid through the system. It's gonna either be uh, primarily a, a propylene glycol mixture then you have an electric system, which is going to use a heat uh, uh, cable that goes into the slab. Um, what exactly are we trying to melt? What's the area that I'm trying to melt? It? Am I trying to melt the entire parking area, or am I just trying to melt select areas? Uh, how am I controlling the system? Do I need insulation? Where's the water going to go? Drainage is a big, big deal for snowmelt systems, and primarily because Water doesn't necessarily flow the same way on a snowmelt system as it does in the middle of the spring uh, when it's just raining. And the primary reason for that is in the summertime when it's raining, water has a tendency to be able to go off all four sides of, a, of the, say, parking lot area. So if we're doing a driveway for a residence, it can shed off of all sides. In a snowmelt environment, we don't necessarily have all four sides. We have areas on the outside that are going to be snow covered still, and that water may not be able to penetrate through that snow barrier. You're dealing with frozen ground. So even though water could shed off to the side, it's not being absorbed by the soil. Um, so it's going to tend to want to go downhill, and you may end up with more water on a snowmelt scenario than you would, like I said, just spring rains. So we need to be able to account for how we're going to remove that water from the snowmelt area. So usually it's always recommended to have some sort of drain system installed or at least have some consideration from a topical standpoint to allow the water to flow into a designated area. Um, surface materials, are we dealing with concrete, sand and brick pavers, asphalt, 
those play a factor in what I design and how I design my system, and then site conditions. Again, slope, drainage, all that good stuff. Um, electric systems are going to be used by some sort of cabling system. Now, they may be pre-manufactured into a mat, which helps uh, reduce installation time, just a convenience factor. Or it's going to be a hydronic system where we actually embed some sort of pipe in the slab uh, to facilitate the movement of water through those. Electric systems. Uh, some advantages to an electric system is that it's going to typically be lower installation costs. Now, from this standpoint, installation costs simply refers to uh, labor to install. Um, we're not necessarily taking into account product or material or ancillary components, uh, just general time to install. One of the reasons why it's lower cost to install is that because of the map format, we can install a larger area at one time. So generally, it takes less time to install an electric system. Uh, generate less warm-up time on an electric system. Primarily, the reason why is just uh, dynamics. An electric cable, when you flip the switch, it's instantly hot everywhere along that cable length. It's an electric resistance cable. So when you turn the system on, uh, the piece of wire that's right next to the, the controller is going to get hot just like the end of the cable that may be 150 feet away. So it's delivering energy instantly across that mass. Um, generally, the cable is spaced closer together, so you have less distance to go horizontally. Um, so the overall system tends to respond a little bit quicker. Um, it's ideal for smaller areas. Um, now, there's a couple reasons that we say that. One is the overall system cost. Um, generally speaking, anything below, say, 100 or 1,500 square feet is tends to, to lean more towards an electric system from an overall cost standpoint for material and time and all that stuff. The reason why is I don't have any mechanical aspects to an electric system. I don't have to worry about a boiler. I don't have to worry about circulators. I don't have to worry about all the mechanical room components. I don't have to worry about the glycol fluid that goes in the system. So all those things have a pretty heavy weight cost per square foot on a small area. Now, as we get above 1,500 square feet, the cost of the mechanic room gets spread out over a much larger area, so it doesn't become as much of a, a cost factor. Um, and you tend to get into more of a system advantage from a price standpoint above that point. Now, that's not to say that we can't do large areas electrically. You can. Uh, you can do tens of thousands of square feet electrically. Um, we did a system uh, for a casino. Uh, it was 9,000 square feet, all electric. And their rationale for doing that had nothing to do with really cost of material or anything else. It had everything to do with how they were installing the system. Um, in order to install a hydronic system, they had to figure out how to get all the piping back into the main mechanical room, which was inside the casino. They had to figure out how they're going to run supply and return lines. They're going to have to disrupt the casino floor, all these things became a factor. They had to disrupt the exterior of the building, um, so that potentially meant cutting into sidewalks and cutting into walkways and other things like that. Whereas the electric system was a little bit simpler, less intrusive, because they had power everywhere around the building. They didn't have to come into the building to get the power. So it was a different driver for them to make that selection. So all these things are... are uh, good to know, right? It's good to understand what our customers' needs are and what their goals are when we select a solution. Uh, disadvantage on an electric system. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, nope, we have a question come in uh, here. Uh, what would be considered a small area for an electric system? Uh, you can go down to as small as 10 square feet. Um, can't go any smaller than 10 square feet. So you need at least 10 square feet up. Um, and, and that's that's really the only limitation on area that we have. Um, so small porches, maybe a walkway from the front porch to the driveway, uh, the entrance area to a, a retail shop, you know, those areas that may not be large areas in the sense of tens of thousands of square feet, but 150 square feet, ideal for an electric snowmelt system. Hope that answers that. Um, Thank you. Higher operating costs, uh, at that point, you're really looking at what's your cost per kilowatt, 
right? Um, electricity in most areas, not all, uh, electricity tends to have a higher cost per unit of energy than say natural gas or propane or anything else that you would see used on a hydronic system. So your, your cost to operate tends to be a little bit higher for an electric system than it does for a hydronic system. Another yep. follow-up question here, above 1,500 square feet hydronic system option should be considered? Um, typically, that's that's where we start to look at hydronic um, first. Doesn't mean you can't use electric, you sure can. Uh, electric is still a valid solution. Uh, you just tend to see more of a, you tend to see a lower cost per square foot hydronically above 1,500 square feet. Electric systems tend to be pretty linear. You know, it's gonna cost X dollars per square foot, whether it's 100 square feet or 1,500 square feet or 10,000 square feet. Your cost per square foot's pretty much the same. And the reason why is it's the same cable and it's the same controller. There's really no variable there between those two. Um, hydronically though, um, the boiler, the cost of a 2,500 or 250,000 BTU boiler and a 750,000 BTU boiler isn't as much, right? There's not a huge uh, cost variance there. So your cost per square foot goes down as we get more square footage to snow melt on a, on a hydronic system. Uh, hydronic advantages, uh, generally lower operating costs, and that's ju just directly uh, to what my natural resource is that I'm using. Um, fuel choice is different. Uh, electric systems, I'm limited to electric, obviously, it's, that's all I have. Hydronic systems, I can use a wider range of natural resources. Like I said, it can be natural gas, it can be propane, it can be waste oil. Um, a lot of different things that we can use for those. Greater design flexibility. Um, in, in that sense, what we're looking at is I have more options than just an electric cable. I can maybe choose uh, tubing options or uh, different accessories that may be more compatible with the application itself from a construction standpoint. Um, disadvantages here are typically higher installation costs. Um, it takes more time typically install a hydronic system because we're doing each section of pipe you know, one foot at a time, as opposed to electric systems can be larger mats, so I can cover larger square footages. Um, disadvantage also is maintenance. Hydronic systems just require maintenance. Electric systems do not. Uh, electric systems are, 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 that's one of the reasons why electric systems are ideal, maybe for smaller residential applications, because the, the homeowner doesn't have to worry about anything. They don't have to worry about glycol, they don't have to worry about pumps, they don't have to worry about the boiler being serviced. So less yearly maintenance. Hydronic systems, I gotta check that glycol. I gotta make sure it's not degrading on me, it's still good, it's not, it hasn't gone acidic on me and all that good stuff. Carl, we had a yes, couple sir. questions come yep. through here. Um, first one, do you have experience with electric or hydronic systems for ice mitigation systems for water control gates, dam gates? For what kind of gates, I'm sorry? Uh, dam, D-A-M? Uh, no. I don't, um, but it sounds interesting. Um, I can't see why it, it wouldn't work, but uh, I have not had any experience with those uh, directly, so I can't speak to those. Um, but it'd be in interesting to take a look at, though. And was there another question? Yep, uh, another question here. Is heat recovery common in hydronic snowmelt systems, whereas you use some waste heat to serve the snowmelt system? Yes, you can definitely use, uh, be creative on your heat source. From a design standpoint, I don't care what provides the heated water or provides the BTUs. Um, I have looked at uh, tying into a chiller or a, a cooling tower system where they're extracting heat off the water and they need some place to dump it. We have taken that extracted heat into a snowmelt system. Uh, we look at uh, on freezer systems when providing frost protection under large commercial freezers, we will take the extracted heat off the freezer unit itself and convert it into heat into the floor. Uh, grocery stores, we have taken waste heat off of their freezers um, in the grocery store uh, and dumped it out into a snowmelt system out into the portico. So when people come in, so they're actually 
really there's no cost other than the running of the circulator to do those snowmelt systems. So I'm not really picky about what provides the heat or what elevates the water temperature. As long as I can meet the BTUs and the water temperature requirement, I'm good. One more question here. Yep. How do you compare electric versus hydronic in terms of durability? They both really have the same durability. Um, both are engineered to be embedded directly into the mass, whether it's concrete or the sand brick pavers and all that good stuff. So normal standard uh, aging effects of concrete, for example, concrete, all concrete cracks, all concrete kind of has these micro shifts over time. Um, all those things are going to be uh, absorbed and, and managed by whether it's a hydronic system or a cabling system. Uh, if the slab were to shear, heave, gap, you know, anything that's outside of the norm, um, no system is going to withstand that. So you have to kind of keep it in perspective of just natural mi uh, micro cracks, spider webbing, uh, things that slabs, all slabs do, not a problem. Um, the rewire, the rebar that's in the concrete is going to take all of that stress and the cable or the pipe is, is going to just kind of go along right with it. So uh, to be honest with you, I have yet to see an electric system or a hydronic snowmelt system fail um, before the slab or the snowmelt area was replaced. Um, I can't think of anything where the pipe just gave up the ghost, so to speak, and said, up, oh, we're done. Um, you almost end up replacing the driveway because it's aged more than anything else. So I can't think of anything where that was the issue. You always end up with more issues relative to external factors, um, i.e. you came through and drilled through the concrete slab to anchor something to it and you hit a pipe. That's usually where you end up with damage or issues. And that's not a big deal. You just simply clear it out, make a repair and away you go. Any other questions? Uh, nope, good for now. Okay, excellent. Um, energy factors. When we look at designs, uh, we're kind of looking at a lot of different aspects um, to what's going on in the snowmelt system. And, and one of the things that I always like to talk about is snowmelt systems is really, designing a snowmelt system is really the art of best guess. I really don't know what's going to happen from snowfall to snowfall. As a designer, I look at at an instantaneous point in time. You know, ASHRAE, all the, the research data that we pull up on is looking over a 30-year average, right? And so they normalize that data, so we have a, a target that we're designing around. Um, you know, if you live in Colorado, your average snowfall may be 12 inches a day um, from ASHRAE's perspective, but do you get 12 inches every snowfall? No, you may get six inches today, you may get 24 tomorrow. It's all over the place. So really what I'm doing is I'm looking at best guess. I'm trying to design around a system that's from a normalized perspective. Some of the factors that go into that is snowfall itself. How much snow am I getting? The density of the snow, how wet is it? Um, what, what's the evaporative losses? You know, are we dealing with drifting snow? Because if you have a uh, drifting snow, even across a given area, you can have 12 inches in one spot and four in another, you know? So what does that mean? Well, it means that area that has four inches of snowfall is going to melt sooner and it's going to open up to the atmosphere faster. And you're going to get up with different losses to the atmosphere than what's still being covered. It's a blanket of snow, right? So you have a different heat transfer area in that area where the snow is. So we have to kind of take all those factors in when we design these systems to try to create a medium, a, a, a baseline that we could design for. Um, typically speaking, uh, snow melts are going to fall between 75 and 250 BTUs a square foot. Like, holy cow, there's a wide range. Yep, there is. And there's a lot of factors or a couple design factors that go into that range. Um, one of them is what we refer to as the, the uh, three area ratio. And basically what that looks at is how much of the snow am I wanting to keep up with? So you have three categories, a, a class 0, 0.5, and a 1. And a, a 0 class says that, hey, as, as the snow falls, I'm not really going to melt anything. 
I'm going to wait till the, the snowfall stops, and then I start to, to melt snow. It's a much slower response time. Typically, you have a lower BTU load there because I'm, I'm allowing a longer time to reach temperature. Um, the 0.5 snowfall or free area ratio is I'm going to try and keep up with half of the snowfall. So if I'm falling six inches of snowfall, I'm going to try and melt three of it during that snowfall period. Um, and then the, the other three will get melted afterwards. A little bit higher BTUs because I'm trying to mitigate the time factor. I'm trying to bring the slab up to temperature as quick as I can or, or quicker. Then we have a free area ratio of one, which is no snow accumulation at all. So these areas are going to take the highest BTU ratio, and it means that there won't be any snow buildup. So I got to have the fastest response possible. Uh, those type of systems are going to be your critical use areas, your hospitals, your landing pads, your uh, handicap access ramps, those type of things where you just can't allow anything uh, to build up at all. Um, typically speaking, uh, Residential is going to be a zero. We're going to be the, the smaller load size. Most residen residences aren't under a critical need in the sense that they don't have to get in and out at a moment's notice. They're looking more convenient. Um, so it's going to be on the lower end of that, that scale. Okay. Uh, insulate, uh, the other factor, before I back up to this as I thought about this, one other factor of this is, is going to be the uh, confidence level. Uh, it's not on this slide, but the confidence level basically says, how confident am I that what I'm designing for actually will happen? So if my design calls for 12 inches of snowfall, am I 75% yeah, confident or 100% confident that every snowfall is going to be 100, or 12 inches, right? So if I design for 12, and I know from practical experience of living in an area, you know, all my life or whatever, I can say, yeah, you know, it calls for 12 inches on ASHRAE because in the 70s, that's what we used to get. But nowadays, it really is more like 10 or 8. I can kind of design for a lower confidence factor. It's like, eh, we're not going to be at that point. That confidence factor says, mm, I can slough on my BTUs a little bit. But the closer I get to 100% and my design conditions, it's always going to maintain that condition. So there's another factor that we can kind of play around with. Again, it's trying to mitigate that best guess scenario, right? Um, insulation. Oh, we had another, sorry, to yep. we had another yep. question come in here. Where would 160 BTUH square feet square foot rank in the area free ratio scale? Um, that's going to be at least a a 0.5, if not a, a one. It's it's going to be on the higher end of of the snow melt design. Most snow melt systems. Uh, fall between 125 to 150. That's kind of your your common range. Anything above 150 BTUs a square foot starts to get into those higher performance systems. Um, and really, 160 to two two and a quarter. Um, that's going to be your range for those those class ones, basically. Um, insulation. To insulate or not insulate. This is probably one of those topics that come up every time I talk about snow melting systems. And you can ask 10 different people and you will get 10 different answers on whether or not you insulate. How do you insulate? What's the purpose of the insulation? Is there a payback on the insulation? All these different factors come into play. And, and a lot of people have a pretty strong opinion on whether you should or shouldn't. Some people are just adamant. You absolutely always have to insulate. Some people are not. They're like, yeah, you kind of do what you want to do. Um, I'm going to look at one aspect of insulation and kind of give you a feel for what is it that we're really gaining when we insulate. There are pros and cons to when we insulate. Um, what we insulate with is a factor. Um, if we are doing anything with ground-based systems, we need to use a closed cell insulation board. So extruded polystyrene uh, is, is a great example of that, Dow Blue Board um, type thing. You need to take into account vehicular loading and the density of the insulation being used. So if we're talking foot traffic, um, a one-inch insulation board would be fine. That's rated to 25 PSI of compressive strength. If you're talking buses, you're probably going to have to go up to a two-inch board. That's rated to 100 PSI of compressive strength. So what we do 
is going to be dependent upon how the area is being used and what what type of uh, environmental conditions it's going to experience. Um, is there landscaping around the area? Um, are there secondary things next to the slab that could be impacted by generating heat? Uh, those things can drive whether I insulate or not as well. So, um, uh, what do we got here? Oh, uh, continuous idle. You, you don't see those much anymore. Um, used to be a big deal. Um, idling systems were kind of those, the early systems response to rap, rapid uh, turnaround on a system. You know, when we always want to have that helipad or that hospital access ramp always free of snow, we would idle the system. And basically what that meant is we kept the slab right at 30, 32 degrees so that when snowfall was detected, I was already there. I was already at the melting condition. So my response was nearly instantaneous. The problem was, how often does it snow? A dozen times a year? 15 times a year. So for 15 days of snowfall, you're idling the system for 90. So your cost of operation was, was pretty expensive. So anything that we could do to reduce cost and to focus all the heat into the slab was a big deal. So you saw a lot of insulation used on idled systems. Nowadays, when we, we'll talk about this here in a minute. Hopefully I'm not talking too, too slow. Um, the controls help mitigate that nowadays. Uh, our controls now have uh, Wi-Fi interface. They're preemptive on, on startup, so you can get the system to start ahead of time before snowfall starts. So it's at temperature when snowfall happens, just like an idle system, but we're not maintaining slab temperature year-round. Um, so that those type of situations, insulation kind of changes its effectiveness, right? Um, Cold start systems, systems that are going to be operating when it's really, really cold, or you have a, an environmental condition that is going to suck heat away from the slab. You're building right, right on top of bedrock. You need to decouple that slab from the bedrock, or the bedrock's going to rob all your heat. Um, so those type of things can, can impact whether I insulate or not. Um, perimeter edge, um, kind of always a good option. If you're doing a snow melt, um, it kind of helps uh, keep the heat into the slab from the edge standpoint, um, but especially if there's landscaping. So you have roses and trees and bushes lining a snowmelt area like a sidewalk. Whenever that snowmelt system runs, if it, there's no vertical edge insulation, the root zones are going to sense some of that heat, and they're going to go through the warming and cooling cycles throughout the winter, which may not be the best thing for the plants. All right, just from a bare-bones cost versus return scenario on insulation. Um, I want to just kind of run real quickly through a, a real quick cost evaluation on whether or not just spending the money on the insulation is worth it. A lot of other factors to consider, response, all these other things. Uh, this is just one perspective. If I am looking at a cost for a therm of, of gas at a dollar a therm, cost for insulation being 75 cents a square foot, if I'm doing a thousand square foot snow melt area, that's a $750 uh, cost for the insulation. If I'm looking at load variances, BTUs needed with insulation versus BTUs without, 125 BTUs a square foot if I insulate, 150 if I don't, about 25% variance. Now, the reason why it's not more is basic heat transfer. Where's all my heat going to want to go? Coldest surface. Where's the coldest surface? Typically up into the snow melt area. Um, that's that's where the energy is going to naturally want to go. You're going to have some that goes down on startup because there's going to be a closer temperature spread. But as that ground underneath starts to warm, then your delta T variables between the system and the coldest point starts to shift. And the longer it runs, the more heat that's going to naturally want to go up into the snow. So your, your effectiveness starts to diminish over time, right? So that's why your, your average BTU load isn't that big of a variance. So looking at that variance over a four hour runtime event is gonna basically get a variance of about 10 to $15 per season. And you look at that over the cost of the insulation, it's gonna take you about 75 years to pay for that insulation. Uh, Typically speaking, 
is is it really worth using the insulation simply from a cost return standpoint? I don't know. Um, I usually don't look at insulation when I design systems. I usually design them without insulation. A, it's worst case. Um, it's going to give me the, the highest load cost. It's also going to help me avoid any issues relative to what's going on the slab. Am I dealing with foot traffic or buses? At this point, it doesn't matter. I don't have to worry about that loading effect because if I don't choose the insulation correctly and it compresses, um, then you end up with a cracking potential down the road. Right? So again, a lot of other factors that drive whether I want insulation or not, this is just one perspective. Um, okay, typical spacing, installation type. Uh, I, electric systems are almost always fixed. They're, they're fairly small. Um, four to six inches variance on cables or, or, or three to four or, you know, there's, there's usually a fairly narrow window on what that cable space is going to be. Hydronic systems, not so much. You have open rain on what you space the pipe at. Typically speaking, uh, between six and 12 inches on center is what we're shooting for. Uh, normally, we talk about six, nine, and 12. Why? Well, no other reason other than from an installation standpoint, most of the time we're dealing with either a rewire mesh that's a six by six grid. Six inches or intervals of six inches are easy to see. Um, if you're doing rebar, typically they're 12 inches on center. So again, it's a visual aid. Um, most people can see six, nine, and 12. From a performance standpoint, however, never go wider than 12 inches on center. Um, there's not enough, um, let me rephrase that. Anything wider than 12 inches on center, your path to cold is gonna be more up than it is side to side. So I'm gonna convey more energy up than I will laterally. And that area in between, that dead space in between won't get enough heat to melt the snow. So you're gonna end up with a driveway that looks like a candy cane. It's gonna end up being striped and you'll never get that area to melt because it can't drive the energy laterally fast enough before it goes up to the cold, right? So 12 inches is about as wide as you wanna get on spacing. Um, typically, you want to have the pipe at least two inches down in the concrete slab, if not three. Now, if we're talking heating systems, interior spaces, we always talk about two-inch cap um, because we have saw cuts and we have other things like that that we want to be at least two inches down on the heated slab. Snowmelt systems tend to be either two to three inches down. It's a little bit deeper on a snowmelt system. And the reasoning there is because not only the saw cuts that we talked about before, but also the vehicular loading. I need enough mass and structural integrity above the pipe to help diffuse that heavy load, point load, i.e. a wheel, um, around the pipe. So it's a structural aspect of it. So we may need to be a little bit deeper in a snowmelt system, but definitely no closer than two inches on center or two inches from the, the surface. Um, total snowfall amounts, um, or not so much snowfall months, but years of, of oper hours of operation versus cost, you can kind of see what a, a typical cost would be between natural gas and electric um, for larger areas. Um, this is for 5,000 square foot snow melt area. That's the variance. As you start getting into those small areas, like the 1,000 square foot area, your cost of operation becomes closer. So that's where electric starts to shine a little bit. Right. That's why we always talk about electric on small areas. Um, idling. This is kind of what happens when we talk about those older systems that actually idled. Real, real high dollar amount associated with an idling system. That's where the new controls really shine. They have taken that idling factor out, given us the same response without the cost. Okay. Um, Real quick uh, comparison to operational cost for a snow melt versus potentially the cost to remove snow manually. Uh, you're dealing with labor, you're dealing with where do we put the snow, how do we mitigate uh, the, the hazmat potential, you have salts and debris and all that potentially in the snow. Um, those add costs to managing the snow, manual snow melt removal. All right, next poll. What is the most common snow melt size? Poll is open. And I assume this is 
what they see, Greg? Yeah, they can see the question on the right side of the WebEx with the. Well, I mean, what is the most common symbol size that they get requests for? Is that what that's referring to? Yes. Okay. All right, give it a few more seconds here, and I'll show the results. For, for us, you know, we've seen snow melt sizes in the magnitude of hundreds of thousands of square feet. Um, parking garages, big area for snow melt systems, especially the upper deck, um, mainly because it's nearly impossible to get snow removal equipment up there. It's full of cars. You know, it's, it's dangerous. You have blades, you know, dump trucks or tractors with blades. The risk of running into somebody's car goes up exponentially. Where do you put the snow as you're blading it? You end up just burying cars that are parked there nine times out of 10. Um, it, it really is an issue uh, for, for parking garages, especially at airports, because cars are gonna be there for an extended period of time. It may be different at a, at a, a mall um, or a retail outlet where cars are typically gone at night and you can get in and blade Say at midnight, you have pretty much free reign. The parking lot's open, but not so much for an airport, right? You can see the results. Yeah, a thousand to five thousand square feet. That's probably um, most residential to light commercial would fall in that range. Um, spot melting, you know, the entrance areas to, to hospitals and stuff would probably fall in that range. So, yeah, nice. Okay, controls, real quick. Um, a lot of different control scenarios out there. Most of the controls nowadays offer a lot of different uh, pre-configured um, options, whether it's Wi-Fi interface, um, you're, you're having the ability to preemptively uh, start a system. They tie into weather apps so they know snow's coming. They have backnet capabilities. So on a commercial job where you're trying to tie into the building automation system, these controls would directly tie into those systems. Um, and then sometimes you have controllers that actually uh, allow you to do some creative optimizing. So there are controls that you can set a smaller control per area and you can actually end up um, cycling through the system a little bit differently. I think there's an illustration on that up here in a minute. Um, most snow systems are going to use um, some sort of sensor that's in the, the slab area or the snow melt area that is gonna detect snowfall it's going to detect moisture. It's going to detect uh, the slab temperature itself. Most of these have some sort of heated display or heated surface to them. So this little uh, conical shape here is a grid that's heated. Snow falls on it, snow melts, ice melts, whatever the precipitation is. And that water then completes the circuit, turns the system on. Pretty straightforward. You need to keep these uh, slab sensors clear of debris. Um, so probably once a year, once every couple of years, it would be good to go through and just kind of clean them out, make sure the, the summer uh, snow and or summer dust and grass clippings and all that stuff that accumulate over the summer months get kind of cleaned out before snow season starts so that it has a good uh, clean surface to detect snow. Um, there are options for aerial mounts. Um, so if you don't want to put a sensor in the slab itself, you can do an aerial mount. Uh, these are, are great if you want to add a secondary sensor. Um, sometimes things just happen and they forget to put the sensor in the slab. Um, or they put the sensor in and they don't run a conduit for the electrical. I've seen a lot of different things happen. And you just really don't have a choice but to do an aerial sensor. Um, they work exactly the same way. Um, as, as a slab mount, you just don't have the integrated slab sensing temperature effect. There's a secondary sensor that you can run in the slab if you need to. Um, key thing about these things, keep them away from heat sources. So don't mount them on the side of the building next to the, the uh, vent for the boiler. Don't mount them directly under the eave where they don't get snow. Um, so you have to kind of think about where you put them. Um, some typical piping examples. Um, whether you're doing a single zone or multiple zones. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna kind of bounce through these a little bit. Um, 
building automation systems, again, uh, they tie into the back net for the building. A lot of different ways you can control the mechanical. You can do a three-way, four-way modulating valve. You can do injection pump mixing. You can do heat exchangers. Kind of depends upon what my heat source is. Um, you can do steam to water heat exchangers. A lot of things that can supply the heat to the snowmelt system. Again, I'm not real picky on what that is, uh, as long as I have the BTUs and the water temp. Um, temperature of the slab typically is going to be about 35 degrees. Uh, the reality is, is while we'll, we're melting snow, the slab temperature won't get much above 32, um, just the heat diffusion effect. So we really want to keep that slab from a target standpoint around 35. Um, one of the things that we want to keep an eye on, though, is surface tensile stress. So this is where that minimum of two inch depth comes into play. I want to have the pipe deep enough in the slab right? So there's enough covering to diffuse the heat. So I don't have a real uh, steep thermal gradient across the surface. There's a rule of thumb in the industry that talks about nothing higher than 150 degree water temp running through the pipe uh, on a hydronic system. And that's really any system. Our slab cables are 120 degrees, give or take. That's that requirement of 150 degrees really came out of the 50s, the 1950s, where before that, uh, electric cables were used a lot, but there was no control over the electric cables, and those suckers just ran wild, and they could get as hot as 180 to 200 degrees, and that type of high temperature instantaneous um, flip from cold to 180 degrees would definitely in invoke cracking in a concrete slab. Um, there just wasn't enough time for the for the mass to expand and absorb the heat. Hydronic systems, on the other hand, not so much. Um, it's real hard to crack a slab hydronically. Um, system sitting idle, the water temperature of the, of the water in the slab is the same as the slab temp, zero degrees, let's say. Snowfall is detected, system turns on, system starts pumping. You got zero degree water coming back into the boiler, which is trying to raise it up. And your output temperature is going to be 50 degrees. 60 degrees, it's going to be 80 degrees, it's going to slowly come up to temperature over time because you're dealing with such a high delta T initially. The mass has time to respond. Um, that's why snowmelt systems have a half hour, 45 minute hour response time before you start to see melting is because of that initial ramp up. Real hard to shock a slab hydronically. Not saying it can't be done, it's just more complicated and more difficult than if you had an electric system in, the, in there. Um, you could do a multiple sensors in areas. Um, if you don't know the best place for a sensor, throw an extra one in, wire to it, keep the, the wires at the controller in case you have to switch it. Why would we need to do that? Well, uh, point in use, we did a, a snowmelt system years ago for the JB Hunt system down in Arkansas. Great. Great facility, beautiful new building. Um, one thing that wasn't taken into account was the shape of the building and the shadow that the building cast across the snowmelt area. Um, the sensors were placed out in the big open area of the parking lot. Nice, clear sun, all exposure to the snow, no shadows. But the area next to the building was shadowed, um, and it didn't always get the same amount of sunlight when the system wasn't running, and it was a trap for blown snow. Um, snow would blow in, get trapped up against the building shape, and it would pile up against the sidewalks. So you had, even though there wasn't snowing, you had snow buildup. Prime example of, of putting in a separate sensor to allow the system to kind of dictate which one is, is driving the need for snow melt. Some of the controls allow you to do some creative things with the, the sizing. Um, so in this case, you have four zones, four smaller controls. These controls can daisy chain and talk to each other so that you can rotate the snow melt areas um, throughout. So if from a just simplistic standpoint, if each of these areas call for 100,000 BTUs of snow melt load, together it require 400,000 BTUs. So my boiler would have to be a half a million BTU boiler and I would run them all at once. But if my heat source is much smaller and only have 100,000 BTUs, well, I can still use that smaller boiler and do all of this area, they would just cycle through. Melt zone one first, then roll over melt zone two second, roll over melt zone three second, third. The controllers would talk to themselves and say, hey, yep, this zone's free of snow. 
now we're going to run this one. Oh, it's free as snow. Now I'm going to run this one. You can program it. So it's really kind of a uh, simpler way uh, to optimize maybe existing equip equipment without having to put in another boiler or replace it for a bigger one. Um, this is all kind of dealing with just the interface. User interface is big now. Wi-Fi, apps, online interface allow you to see what's going on is big. Um, remote access allows you to also manage multiple snow melts differently. So I can have a snow melt at my primary residence and a snow melt at the lodge up by the lake. Um, I can have the lodge not run on snowfall events because why run it when I'm not there? However, Friday afternoon, I'm going up for the weekend. I can punch in on the app and go turn on. And any snow that's there is going to be free because I turned it on manually. So by the time I get there, I don't have to worry about shoveling snow. Um, the app allows me to do that. Colin, we had a it's, question come through here. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're good. I, I had clients request a switch for hydronic snow melt system so they can control the system manually. Is there such a switch? Um, Which is you can important. use just about any switch. Um, it, if you're dealing with relays, usually you can do a 24-volt switch. You're just engaging a coil on a relay. You can manually do that. Um, we don't like those. Um, if you want to do a manual switch, make sure you do one with a timer function to it. So you kick it on, and the timer runs, and it, it shuts off, and it shuts the system off. The biggest problem with switches, manual switches, you turn them on, you walk away, you forget your snowmelt system's running. Um, and it runs literally nonstop for days on end. That's not what you want. So if you want a manual start, that's fine. But choose something that has an automatic off to it. Mechanical systems, um, a lot of different ways to, to skin this cat. Um, you can field build your mechanical solution, or you can purchase a lot of manufacturers nowadays have some sort of pre-configured solution that you can drop in. Anything you buy and you can just hang on a wall and pipe to it typically saves you time on the job site. Um, you don't have to worry about testing the system per se in a sense of, of, of make sure all the solder joints are, are good and, and secure. Um, it's really a time factor. Um, most of them come with a warranty. So you have some sort of sense of if anything were to go bad, it's covered by the manufacturer. All these things kind of factor into what it is that you're trying to, to provide. Um, a lot of different configurations, again, to, based on how the systems are designed. Um, piping options for a hydronic system. One of three most common ones that are out there, you have EPDM rubber, um, flexible, twistable, um, typically UV resistant. Uh, you have PEX, polyethylene cross-linked plastic, and then you also have PERT or uh, PEX aluminum PEX. Again, an, another variable of, of PEX with an aluminum barrier inside to help with structural integrity of the pipe. Um, and it just allows you to bend the pipe and it keeps its shape. Um, whereas uh, EPDM pipe doesn't have that uh, retention once you bend it, but it does bend a lot easier, more flexible. So it allows you to maintain shapes um, easier. Uh, again, just variables. They all provide the same snow melting capability and they all provide the same performance. Really, we're going to choose these based on uh, maybe what the application requirements are, the installation hurdles. Um, EPDM tends to be more flexible in colder environments. So if you're doing a, a wintertime install, i.e. around uh, you know 30 degrees outside, 40 degrees outside, it may be easier to work with. Kind of pros and cons there. Um, uh, a couple more tidbits on the EPDM. It's UV resistant. It's crust resistant. Doesn't really kink. Um, PEX aluminum PEX. Um, it does have uh, strength and some memory. It does have that aluminum barrier into it. It's, it's durable like PEX is. They're all very durable. All made for job site abuse, which is key. Um, accessories include manifolds, uh, flow meters on manifolds, indicators. Um, you can have supply and return piping that's pre-insulated. Um, pre-insulated piping helps me Minimize transmission losses from the boiler out to the point of use. So especially if you have an area that's long ways away, you don't want to give up all that heat to the ground in between. So anything that's insulated is going to help um, improve efficiencies and response times. Uh, manifolds, a lot of different manifolds out there. You can have uh, 
custom copper manifolds. You can have uh, stainless steel manifolds. There are brass manifolds. There, they all have their their widgets that kind of give advantage to the job site. Um, a lot of the stainless steel, maybe brass manifolds, have flow meters associated with them. They have uh, dual ball valves for positive isolation of circuits, so it allows for balancing of systems a little bit easier, a little bit quicker. Um, you can maybe dial in a manifold based on a delta T requirement a little bit faster. Um, poll number four, what types of tools do you normally use when quoting and designing a snowmelt system? Yes, I just opened the poll a few seconds ago. This is a free form answer, no multiple choice. Some people will do manual calcs. Some, there are a lot of software solutions out there today that uh, will do them for you. Um, you just, you know, we're just kind of curious to see what it is that you use. Some people just do swag, you know, they just know it's 120 BTUs a square foot and it works. Um, the nice thing about snowmelt systems is we're trying to optimize the design. We're trying to minimize the mechanical requirements. So the design software helps us do that, helps us optimize what we're looking for. If you're one of those guys that just swags it, Generally speaking, the only thing that you have to, to worry about is time. Um, most swags, if you're doing it enough and know that you're pretty accurate, um, your variable that you're playing with is time. Does it take you 45 minutes to come up to temperature or two hours? You know? Kyle, it looks like a few people responded. Can you see yep. those results? I cannot. Where are they? I don't see any results. I do not see them either. I apologize for that, but uh, that's okay. If you want, I can try to find them. All right, we'll beat you later. All right. Um, just in summary here, uh, we'll kind of wrap up, start to wind down here. Um, Snowmobile systems offer a variety of ways that, to address safety. We kind of talked about that. Um, time, convenience, all those good things. Uh, liability. Prevent structural landscape damages. Yeah, one thing I, I didn't really touch on is the nice thing about snowmelt is that it definitely extends the life of whatever your snowmelt surface is, whether it's concrete or sanded brick pavers or even asphalt, it will extend the life of that uh, material because you don't have that abuse of the salt and the other chemicals. So you get more life out of your out of your system, more more runtime for your money, so to speak. Uh, I'll let Greg kind of talk to these. Yeah, so I just want to briefly mention uh, Selexit. Selexit is our uh, Watts online configurator. You know, it generates uh, optimal system configurations, helps you accelerate your sizing, configuration, selection process for snow melting systems, as well as uh, mixing valves and ACVs. Uh, it also includes our brand new snow melting control selector, which is developed to help indicate the best control for your snow and ice melting system. I just need to answer a few brief questions about your heat source, hot water system, and the tool delivers uh, a custom recommendation to efficiently control and uh, efficiently control in your snow and ice melting systems straight to your email inbox. Um, I can send a link in the chat so you guys can check that out more. If you're interested interested in that and then uh colin can you go to the next slide yep maybe so this is uh one of, one of our other uh digital tools for engineers uh spec hub it's our new project specification tool so with spec hub you're really able to quickly create project specifications it was, it's designed to ensure that your team has the most accurate and complete product information for complex projects such as snow melting projects, uh, keeps your team on track and helps reduce any unforeseen errors, uh, unforeseen issues that can cause delays. Uh, so one of the most significant benefits of Spec Hub is its speed. It's able to quickly select and specify what products, snow melting products, for example, according to your building requirements and codes. And it's just gonna help you save time researching products uh, online as all, all the data is already in the tool as well. Save time writing specs, plumbing schedules, BIM files. Uh, once you're done putting together your project or your spec, the tool will automatically generate those docs for you to download and share that information with uh, with your colleagues. 
Uh, but again, the biggest takeaway here is is the speed of Spec Hub. It's going to save you time and make your job easier. And just a quick note on both of these tools for Selexa and Spec Hub. Uh, I know there's always a concern out there, you know, when we sign up for anything online that you're going to be bombarded with emails. So I just want to reassure everyone that, you know, our team at Watts, you know, really takes this into consideration every day and we try to be mindful of what we send you, how we approach our, our communications with you. Uh, so we only try to send you things that, you know, we think that you would have direct interest in as, you know, engineers and architects. So, yes, we will be sending you emails. Uh, you always have the option to opt out. But I just wanted to bring this up in the hopes that it's not a deterrent for you to check out the tool because we think that, you know, you could miss out on a potentially big opportunity to you know, help save time and you know, make your job easier. So that's all I had to say on those two tools, Colin. Okay. And to just kind of recap, you know, I won't read the list. Um, there's a lot of things that we covered today. And the reality is, is, is we, we just hit the highlights. Um, I greatly encourage any of you who are, still hanging on here uh, to seek out other training on snowmelt um, to, to look at other opportunities to, to dive into the subject matter deeper. Uh, we didn't get into applications much. We didn't get into design variables much. We didn't get into what can I tweak here? We didn't get in any of the mechanical design. You know, there's a lot of as aspects that go into um, optimizing, um, perfecting a snowmelt design. You know, what things can I tweak? What things should I not tweak? Uh, and, and the reality is, just like anything, especially if it's new to you, and this is the first time you've been exposed to what goes into snowmelt designs, it's going to take you probably half a dozen times of, of just being exposed to this information to really start to get it and be able to apply it. So I greatly encourage you to, to seek out some other training opportunities, um, a lot of great opportunities out there in the industry, um, a lot of great manufacturers who provide things, um, as well as lots. So I do encourage that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we went through a lot of things, key design considerations, financial impact, uh, did basic designs. That was, that was a full day for sure. And I'm running long, so I'm trying to race through this. Um, other opportunities with Watts. Um, we don't just do snow melting systems. Um, we do a lot of things. Anything that basically has to do with water mitigation. Um, we, we get, get our hands dirty, so to speak. So. So yes, um, uh, we did have a few questions come yeah. through here and I, I know we're running over time, but hopefully you guys can stick around, around for a little bit longer. Uh, just to go on, first question here, talking about the lodge idea, when turning it on when you're going up, sorry, talking about the lodge idea, when turning it on when you're going up to, does that turn on the system on and flows water or does it turn on only if the sensor senses snow? Uh, Typically, both. Um, it depends on how you set the system up. You can set the system up to where it, it doesn't do anything until the sensor detects snow. Um, if there's snowfall, sensor says, whoop, there's snowfall, then it ramps everything up all at once. Um, turns on the boiler, turns on the circulators, turns on whatever mixing devices you have, uh, gets everything moving. You can set a system up to where you have constant circulation and or just modulating temperature, or you're just keeping things flowing. Uh, you can tie into different heat sources that allow you to do different things so that maybe when the sensor detects snow, it's it's activating different things. So there may be a different way to do that. It just depends upon what we're tying into mechanically um, and what kind of response I want to have um, on the system. Another question here: What is exactly what is exactly is area free zero point five? How is it calculated? Uh, there's an ASHRAE formula for that. Basically, what it's looking at is it's taking your amount of snowfall that you enter as a design data point. So if I enter, I'm getting twelve inches of snowfall. It's looking at the load associated with half that six inches of snowfall, and what's that BTU component required to melt that over a period of time? And that goes into a load factor. Um, it takes that against what the uh, heat diffusion factor is for melting the snow. And it's looking at back and edge loss. And it's looking at all these other dynamics. And it says, OK, this is what my overall BT load needs to be to account for that. Um, are you always accurate? No. I mean, if I look at a, a 0.5 and I want to keep up with half of the snowfall, I'll be somewhere between 40% and 60. I'll be close. 
Um, it all depends upon the density of the snow, which we never know. It could be really dry snow. It could be really wet snow. Um, it could snow really, really fast. Um, it could still be 12 inches of snowfall in a 24-hour period, which is the way the calculations are set up. But is it snowing one inch an hour or four? And that's that's one of those variables that we don't we don't account for because it's just almost nearly impossible to to do that. Um, you'd get so sucked into the minutia of all those little variables that you'd never get through a, des a design. So we look at normalizing the data, how much snow over 24 hours, um, and that's what that looks at. Is it takes half, and it factors that into the load calculations. Long story long. Sorry. That's that's okay. Uh, great answer. Uh, I do see a few questions here around the design tools and future webinars, and I'll take that offline. I'll follow up with you guys on that. I just wanted to stick to the topic here. Uh, Call another question. Can you can we use high mass condensing boiler and eliminate four way valve primary secondary configuration? Yes, um, condensing boilers are great. Um, in fact, they're the, probably the one type of heat source you see the most of. It's it's really ideal heat source. Condensing boilers work great when the return temp is below 90 degrees. So on a snowmelt system, that's perfect condition. It starts up at zero. The return water coming back is zero degrees. Condensing boilers rain, um, and they really capture that efficiency, right? Um, and as long as you can maintain the operational parameters of a condensing boiler, you're fine. You, you really get that 98, 99% efficiency rating, right? Um, where you start to lose that edge on a condensing boiler is when the return temp starts to come up too high. Um, the longer a snowmelt system runs, the, the warmer the return is going to get. And as you start to approach that 90 degree re, uh, return temp or go above, your efficiency will come down slightly on your boiler. So you will see a, a variable efficiency rating as the boiler runs. Um, but Absolutely, ideal scenario is is a condensing boiler with a snowmelt system. Uh, this question came through about twenty minutes ago, so I'm not sure of the context. But what mix of concrete is standard? Uh, what is standard? You know, the good thing about standards is that there are so many options to choose from. Um, standard on concrete is going to be strictly determined by the application. So that's going to be driven by your structural engineer. What is being used? It, what's the vehicular loading? What's the point of use? Not driven by the snowmelt system. I don't care. It could be a 4,000 pound slump or it could be a 10,000 pound slump. I don't, I don't care. Um, it, it really doesn't impact me from a design standpoint, but it greatly impacts the performance of that slab in the application structurally. Um, so I, I would never, say, hey, you got to go to a 5,000 pound concrete as opposed to a four because of the snow melt. It's not, it's not a factor for me. Okay, next question here. What are the maximum loop length for snow melt? Good question. Um, two, a couple things that will drive that. One, in theory, there is no maximum length. Um, you can install any length. The problem is your pump, your circulator. The longer you go in length, the higher your pressure drop is going to be. So, and, and the diameter of the pipe is going to play a factor in that. So if I'm using five eighths or half inch pipe, I'm going to be limited to 200 foot runs. If I go to a three quarter inch uh, pipe, I'm probably going to be 400 foot runs because the diameter is going to greatly impact my, my overall run length. Does that mean that a three quarter inch pipe can't go 600 feet? No, it can. But my head pressure in that system is going to go up drastically. And as long as I'm willing to pay money for the circulator, that high head capacity circulator, I can, in theory, go as long as I want. But there is a diminishing return to where that cost of that circulator is going to be just so high, it doesn't make any sense. right? So we tend to limit our, our run lengths to you know 400 feet for three-quarter inch pipe. Um, having said that, one consideration is when we design radiant systems or snowmelt systems and we use a software solution, the software is kicking out a pump spec at design conditions. So if the design says I need 120 degree water and I need 20 GPM at 30 feet ahead, that 30 feet ahead is at 120 degree water temperature. Snowmelt systems aren't running at 120 when they start up, they're at zero. 
So my head pressure is not 30, it's 50, um, because we have a cold, viscous material in the glycol. So I always oversize my head capacity based on what is presented by the software. I usually do at least 25%, kind of have to weigh that one by gut check, but I always oversize at least 25% Head capacity on the on the output. Another question here: What is the most common tubing material used for a hydronic snowmelt system? Again, that's all over the place. Um, it's either going to be an EPDM or it's going to be PEX uh, and PERT. PERT's become really really popular in the last five years. So one of those three: EPDM, PERT, or PEX is typically what we see. Very good. Uh, would a car parking on top of the sensor hinder operation of snowmelt system? Yes and no. Um, it's good to have the sensor in the tire path. Um, the, the action of driving over the sensor kind of helps keep the debris out of the sensor. Um, but parking on it would prevent it from seeing snowfall. So it would be basically ineffective. So don't park on it, um, but it's good to drive over it. Okay, another question here. Will, will it take about 45 minutes to melt snow no matter if the system is hydronic or electric? It takes about 45 minutes for it to come up to temperature. Yes, whether it's hydronic or electric. Um, and that varies slightly depending upon what the ambient temperature is when we start the system. But as an average, 45 minutes to get to melting, from there, melting time is going to be directly dependent upon density of snow, how much snow, weather conditions. Um, average run time to melt is going to be about four hours, maybe five. Again, depending upon the amount of snow, can be up to six um, in some conditions. But that's your range, about four hours to melt snow. Most of the controls are going to monitor that. If at the end of four hours, it still sneeze and sees a need for snow melting, it'll kick on for another cycle. Very good. And as far as runoff goes, is there a trough or perimeter drain? Would it be a good idea to also have a pipe run there? Uh, pipe as far as the snow melting system goes? Uh, yeah, we typically see if you have the opportunity to, to run the pipe underneath the trough, um, mm -hmm. It kind of helps keep it nice and warm and it allows the, the water that's flowing through there from freezing as quickly. Uh, is it necessary? No, but you're there. Um, if you have the opportunity to do that, it doesn't hurt. Another question here, when the, calcula when the calculations done, is mixed precipitation considered, freezing rain, rain on top of snow, et cetera? No. Um, we typically design simply around snow conditions. Um, the system will operate based on any uh, precipitation. Uh, there, there's an outdoor air sensor that goes with the systems that monitor air, air temperature. So you can set and program the controls to have an air temperature trigger point. So as long as there's precipitation below X, 35 degrees ambient, it will kick the system on and that could be snow, rain, freezing rain, any sort of precip precipitation. Um, if the air temperature is above 35 and it's raining, it won't run, because um, why, right? And what is the ideal Delta T boiler set for snow melt? Um, usually from a, a design standpoint, we look at 30. Um, 30 from a snow melt zone standpoint, uh, the higher Delta T, uh, is because of a couple things. One, I'm not worried about maintaining a comfort temperature like I would on heating, so I can run a higher delta T and have a more of a temperature gradient. As long as I'm above 32, I'm still gonna melt. Um, from a boiler standpoint though, um, just because my snow melt design is at 30 or even 40 degrees delta T, doesn't necessarily mean my boiler's running at that delta T. When we do a mechanical design, I'm you know, from a, a boiler room standpoint, I'm going to use a primary secondary piping configuration. So my zones can be on a 40 and a 30 degree delta T. My boiler could be sized on a 20, depending upon what my heat source is. Um, cast iron boilers, 20 degree delta T. Um, copper fin tube, not so much delta T as it is flow rate. So I'm kind of sizing those things for two different conditions. Um, but the primary secondary 
configuration allows me to decouple those two aspects and size and operate accordingly. Okay, excellent. Those are all the questions we have uh, coming through the chat right now. So I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, Colin. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, no, yeah, they're great questions. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, just to let you know, a recording of the presentation and the CU credit will be emailed to you. Uh, if you do have any more uh, technical type questions, you can send them to Colin at colin.marshall at wattsworry.com or any other questions, send them to myself, gregory.jackman at wattsworry.com. And Colin, if you click to the very last slide here. Uh, so once this WebEx ends, it's going to bring you to a page where you can choose uh, to learn more about those uh, digital tools I was talking about to configure your snow melting systems, uh, selects it, the online configurator, and spec hub, the project specification tool. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Colin. Thank you guys for all the participation and questions. Great engagement. Uh, Colin, you have anything else? No, appreciate it. Again, if you have any questions, like Greg said, just reach out. We're here to help. So. Right. Thank you. Yep, that's awesome. it, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks. <laughs>